I'm going to start by running through all the series. We'll um, probably not spend as much time as all the stuff I did with Bill on Sunday, but we know, we know we have a big game five coming up. But let's start with the game fours. Golden State and Memphis, this one get evened up. I'll be honest, like everybody knows I love Steph and love watching this Warriors team, even though I, I've really appreciated Memphis. I felt like I was rooting for this one just to be done, more so than I was rooting for any team. Uh, this was a brutal game. Um, for most of it. Golden State had 38 points at the half, their lowest playoff half since the 2015 finals. They started 0-16 from three. The last playoff team to start a playoff game, 0-16, was OKC in 2011. But the other thing is, is everybody's watching Golden State miss all their shots. Memphis started 2-16. So it wasn't like anybody was making any shots. The live total, so pre-game, the total on this one over-under was 222, 222 and a half. At the start of the fourth quarter, the live odds went to 187 on the total. Um, Steph had a bad shooting night. Everybody had a bad shooting night, really. Uh, you know, the people that mattered. And then Steph had 18 in less than eight minutes in the fourth quarter, and that's your game. Golden State's first lead was with 45 seconds left in this one. Steph made a couple threes. He drove the lane, got the free throws to put him ahead. Um, there was a lot in this one to not love. Although I would say defensively, there was one play that just kind of sums up what Draymond Green is capable of, both on effort and instincts and intelligence. Just about four minutes to go, Memphis is leading 89-88. This was the block charge that got reviewed that wasn't overturned, and I don't think it should have been. But before Green tried to get the charge on Jaron Jackson, Kyle Anderson was at the left elbow, and he went to turn towards the paint, and Draymond helped off of Jaron Jackson, who couldn't make a three. And it wasn't so much like I'm not respecting Jackson as a shooter. I'm just going to show so that when Kyle turns on the defensive player thinking there's maybe room in the paint, I'm just going to be here. And Draymond basically read it ahead of time going, let me just be here and show him. And then it kind of stopped everything. And then Jackson actually got the drive. Uh, I don't love wasting challenges because you're mad. It happens too often in the NBA. It also happens too often when the player just sits there and says, I'm going to do it. And then Mike Brown filling in. I don't know if that led to it. It's not like he hasn't been with Draymond for years, but I, I don't know. I mean, the, the player is always going to think that he's right. And then when you say, hey, go ahead and challenge this block charge, it's just too hard. It's too hard. And in that spot, Jaron Jackson only hits one of the free throws. Um, he didn't shoot it well, missed all seven of his threes. So if you look at it and say 21 and five, but like I said, everybody missed in this game. If I wanted to, could I have a more concerning who is Memphis's number two guy, like long term conversation? You know, no jaw last night because of the knee. I guess I could. And I just feel like that's kind of the Jaron Jackson story, what you sign up for. But he's also 22 years old. He was healthy this year. He's terrific defensively. But you're kind of in that spot going, all right, who's going to carry them offensively? I think Desmond Bain is hurt. It's very clear. He walks like a guy who has back pain right now. Uh, the numbers from Minnesota to this series are completely different. Granted, Golden State is better. But Bain, who in college, if you watched him, what was great about his NBA story is that he figured out his role very early in the NBA. But he actually is capable of doing a lot more on offense because he did that at TCU. And then you've got Dylan Brooks. Um, Memphis was up one with under a minute. He took a right side bomb three. And that's kind of what he did all night. He was 5-19, 2-9 from three. I don't know if it was the crowd booing him because of hitting Gary Payton and knocking him out maybe of the playoffs um, that had something to do with it where he was like, I'm going to show you. Well, he hasn't shown anybody other than just he's going to shoot and he's going to miss. He's 8-35 of in this series, 4-18. His percentages are 17 and 16% with zero free throws taken. Uh, last night was gross. And I like Dylan Brooks because I think he's one of those tough guys you kind of need. Um defensively we saw what happened in game three I'm not saying he's some lockdown guy but he's going to try and he's going to get physical he's going to use his fouls uh, he's he's been a nice story for his career but last night was gross the Warriors have had the rebounding edge in all four games and I do like um what what Memphis did I like that they tried some Steven Adams stuff in there but you know when it's at the end and they're going to go small and the ball's pinging all over the place they're going to be hunting for Adams and trying to bring him away from the hoop but I do like in those moments of trying to you know, I don't like abandoning somebody who's basically a major rotation guy. Uh, I don't like being stubborn and keeping him in there all the time either, but I kind of like that from them. And they still almost stole this one and even it at two without job. Ja, but it's three one. I think we all know what's going to happen. Boston ties it up with the Bucks two two. It's a weird series for me. You know, yes, do I want Boston teams to do well? Am I absurd about it? No. Um, 
you know, I've had a hard time with the Celtics team all season because I was like, all right, they're really disappointing. And we've seen this now for 200 games with this group, minor changes. And then they turned into this just unbelievable team where all the models love them. Uh, I always thought a little bit too much because when they're down to Milwaukee in the second round without Middleton, because I did think they were going to lose that game last night. I'm like, all right, they're going to go down 3-1 and you know, maybe there was just a bunch of stuff that was wrong. Granted, no Rob Williams and Smart seems a little limited, but Derek White's starting to turn it around. But Tatum, you could tell from the jump, and we're going to get to why this means something in the Western Conference a little bit later, but you could see, and this is what I always think about really great players, is that you can have your bad game, but then you go into it going, okay, Wesley Matthews tried to beat me up a little bit, did a good job, was more physical, was just in my shirt. Be ready, have a counter, go quicker. And you could see from the beginning of this game, that's what was happening. Bill and I talked about Al Horford in game three. He went 22, 16, and five, four, seven on threes. You go, probably not getting that again. No, it got even better. He was the story again in this game. He's the reason they won game four. 30 points, his first ever career playoff game of 30. He's only had nine career 30 point games in his entire career. Uh, and for those that know me well, know that, you know, before, before I was other guys, like Al Horford was my guy. I loved him, loved him out of the draft and then towards the end of Boston it was always a little frustrating because I don't think Celtics fans were like wait this guy's a max guy like why isn't he doing more why isn't he going to initiate more offense that's not really what he does he just doesn't make any mistakes and is is somebody who's capable of doing a bunch of different things and we maybe thought that that was over but he's so smart defensively but the scoring part of it and then the aggression I don't know if that was payback for Giannis staring him down a bit and get a tech for taunting which you know whatever and then Horford went right back at him I thought the elbow was you know was was worthy of a technical himself, but Horford has been the story in this one. So as I watch it play out, I'm I'm fighting with like two different. I don't know if it's it's not seeds of doubt. It's just these planted things, perception wise, of what I think of these two teams at their best and at their worst. Everyone should be scared as hell, of Giannis. Okay, um, but Boston when I, when they're down, I'm like, well. Maybe this is why I thought the models are a little excessive. And now it's even they're going home. They've got home court. And like, who knows? Maybe they're going to be in the NBA finals. I didn't feel that way when it looked like they were helpless against Giannis. Let's talk about the Giannis part of this, too, because Milwaukee, if we're if we're looking at the critical side of it, which, you know, after a team wins a championship in a way, you're like not supposed to do that stuff anymore. You're not allowed to. It's like, hey, whatever. They want a title. But there's there's two things with them that I think are kind of repeating themselves. But it's not as big of a deal now because they won. Had they not won, I think we'd be more critical of what they do in some of their defensive or, excuse me, offensive decisions and how they do stuff. So Giannis stepped out of the game at 5.09 in the fourth quarter, came back in at 4.20. Yes, he was exhausted. And that's why they tried to buy him that minute. I mean, he plays with such ferocity that I think it's sometimes he exhausts himself. Remember that story from Jared Greenberg to the sideline who shared with us during the playoffs last year, like Giannis was sitting really early at the beginning of game one um, or the beginning of each playoff game because he was so worked up. They were like, all right, let's rest you and kind of reset you. He only took one field goal the rest of the game that I have in the tracking there from the last 420 on. So Giannis, who's attacking Jalen Brown on switches, Jalen, who's out there with five fouls. There was Derek White minutes out there to attack, too, where we've seen so many times that Giannis has gotten the switch that he wants, and then he goes and attacks or he drives and kicks because he's so great at playmaking now. Uh, The mid-range game is better for him. And they didn't do any of that. They didn't, and it turned into the Drew Holiday shooting fest. Drew has 92 shot attempts in four games. I realize without Middleton, that's kind of what you'd expect. He's 34 overall, 31% from three. I know he had the big shot in game three. He was 0 of 5 in the fourth quarter. Remember last year when we were like, why won't Milwaukee attack and injure James Harden, who we could see wasn't moving around well, right? Why aren't they doing this more? Um, remember Drew, where right up until, I don't know, what I, there might have been the game seven win against Brooklyn. We were like, what is going on with him? Like, this is the guy you trade all these picks for. This is the guy that you give this kind of contract with his injury. Like the Drew Holiday story did a complete 180 in the playoffs. I still really like Drew Holiday, okay? I would want Drew Holiday on my team. But tasked with this kind of scoring load or this this attempt load uh, is probably not really what you want. So a little surprised that there's so much Drew shooting and even more surprised. And you can say Giannis is tired the last 420, but what does it mean? He's not going to take any shots? 
And I believe he only took one. We did so much Philly Miami Sunday. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. A hardened 16 points in the fourth is everything you'd really need to know about game four. And it's, it's pretty simple. I don't believe he's ever going to be the guy again, you know, MVP vote stuff. I don't think that's a ridiculous thing to say. I think he needs to do a better job of taking care of his body and, and honestly, you know, caring about being a professional athlete a little bit more. And it scares the hell out of me. Like when anybody is this good, it doesn't want to do it. So good luck with that contract. So, that is an entirely different thing. It's a lot like Jimmy Butler in game four going off is like, at least you have a guy who is capable of doing that in the playoffs that understands what is expected of him. Uh, that's, we spend so much time talking about those guys, but that's, that's kind of the job. Like, Hey, help us figure it out when everything's breaking down. We're now games three, four, and five in a series. Everybody knows what's going on, right? Like there's counters here and there, but now we're, we pretty much know what everybody's trying to do here and your special talents, your shot creating talents, you are so special. You have to figure out a way. And the fact that you have Harden, if you're Philadelphia, who you would hope it sometimes is still capable of that. Not every game. Almost no one is capable of it every game. But do you have one of those games in this series, one or two of those games in this series? And Harden gave you that in game four after having really bad second half the first couple Shooting variance is a big part of this that we probably don't spend enough time on, but it'd be a really boring podcast if I came on and just said, hey, this team made more threes than that one. And that's really all it was, just luck on threes. Um, that probably tells a story far more often than we'd want to admit, but it wouldn't get us paid, would it? Uh, games one and two, Miami plus three, plus six, and three-point makes. Games three and four, Philadelphia plus nine and plus nine. But more importantly, this series is just weird because I think we all had to reset and go, oh, that, okay, Embiid is back. And so as dismissive as we were, is, is Philadelphia trying to win this thing without him, which I don't think they were going to. It didn't look that great. Um, we have a series that I have no idea. I have no idea how to read this one other than I'd expect if Embiid stays healthy, he's just going to get better and better, and it's opening up everything. So it's not always just shots made, shots missed. Uh, as I run through games one through four, the shots that you are getting have changed on both sides because of Embiid. All right? So it's it's not just luck on that one. It is the Embiid factor where now Bam isn't running free like he was in the first two games. And you're helping off of him, opening it up for Miami, and conversely for Embiid, you're more worried about him and stuff is happening around him that probably makes the shot attempts a little bit easier. I have to look up the shot quality stuff on Second Spectrum, but I couldn't figure it out this morning. Final one, Chris Paul, game five. I know. I'm aware. I'm aware of of what this means, okay? If we look at the Dallas side of this, I'm not sure what Phoenix is going to do. Do you let Luka go off? Um, do, you, do you perhaps tighten up some less welcoming switches with Luka? Uh, throw in more zone, you know? Um, no pain, no sham. I mean, pain right now is shooting 38% from three in the four games. But then again, who are you going to have play guard for any of those minutes where you have to figure out a way to kind of rest Chris Paul a little bit? The Aiton story is concerning. He had the worst plus minus in game four. I don't think that's, you know, it's it's a game, that, but it felt like it played out. There's there's some real Rudy Gobert-ish stuff happening with Aiton now too, where he's being asked to cover when Dallas goes five out with a small lineup with no Powell. Aiton's stuck kind of defending in the corner and he's helping on some of the Luka drives and then he comes off the corner and then you have, you know, Brunson hit a huge three in game four. Finney Smith, who went from 30% from three his first three years of his career is now 39% over the last three years of his career. He's been terrific. But the the problem with the Rudy stuff was that then you don't do anything on offense and Aiton is clearly much better on offense, but they don't really want to use him. Which whenever I look at a post advantage, disadvantage, then I always kind of stop myself and go, yeah, what are they going to do? Play post basketball now all of a sudden in 2022? Like that's not going to happen. But there may have to be more of an emphasis put on making eight and have them pay. Uh, the other part of this is Kleba does hold up uh, more defensively than people would probably ever admit. But much like Paul having Bullock just work him at the start of game three in that first half, Bullock was terrific. They're very focused on him. It reminds me a bit of the Tatum thing where Tatum knew going into the Wesley Matthews matchup the second time around. Like, okay, all right, I know what he's doing. I'd expect Paul. I'd be shocked if he wasn't just a little bit more aware and getting his momentum going. I and mean, if Dallas is going to meet them immediately, bring the ball over, 
you know, they have to they have to adjust to that a little bit. So I still like Phoenix. I think they're the better basketball team. And do you really want to doubt Chris Paul or me after fouling out of game four and having the family harass slash maybe just offered a hug? I don't.